This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. So if we have our expectations quite clear from the very first moment that they have any interaction with us, we find that it limits any uncertainty. It limits the people who come and try and get in and not know the rules. It limits a whole lot of management aspects, which only makes it easier for people to come in, be seated and just dine, which is at the end of the day what we all want to do. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The lockdown has forced many operators to change, become more agile and adapt to new revenue streams. After altering their businesses so much for long lockdowns, what impact is that having on the restaurant models that will emerge as restrictions ease? Will restaurants revert back to their normal ways? Will they continue on this new trajectory or create new visions of what a restaurant or cafe can be. Renee Wallace is the co-owner of Birch Restaurant in Mossvale, New South Wales. Renee, how are you? Hi, well, thank you. You've uh, made the decision to just pause and wait a little bit before reopening. What was the reasoning behind that? Well, a few reasons factored into it. We made that call last year as we came out of the lockdown, the first lockdown in 2020. And that was pretty much a decision that was driven by sheer exhaustion from everything that we had created. We just wanted to have a quick breath before we jumped back into doing what we had done prior to COVID, but also continuing on what we had created. So coming out of this lockdown, I guess we had hindsight to our benefit, which was a lovely thing. Often in a pandemic, you can say you have hindsight to deal with the situation so it was really pleasing that the whole crew had the same thought and we just thought we just want to give ourselves just that moment to take a breath to see how a few of the more confusing aspects in regards to government mandates and things like that were going to play out Uh, it also gave us a really good opportunity to sneak a few events in that had been postponed due to lockdowns so we could help those people have that celebration that they had have so patiently waited to do. You've made a lot of transitions and changes to your business during this time, but what's it been like in the Southern Highlands in the last year and a half with the random lockdowns and and being open? Overall, it's been, well, it's obviously been tough. I think no region or uh, city is immune to what has been happening over the past 18 months. And I think the, The small town aspect of the Highlands is certainly a positive element that has been a great support to many businesses. So we've noticed a tremendous and almost protective level of support from patrons that we had prior to going into COVID, but we've also attracted a huge amount of new patrons as well. And there's a lot of businesses that that talk to that and speak to that. And most of that has been driven through online presence and social media presence because that has been the primary way in which we've been able to stay connected to each other. But I've also felt that if you're a business in a regional area, it has been a really, really supportive time to be, I guess, out on the fringes because there's just been this huge mateship aspect of it. So people reaching out, to other people who you don't know uh, just to offer support or to offer information or, hey, I did that as well, this is how we found it. That kind of connection was something that was really unexpected and it's something that has certainly grown and it's certainly given us a whole lot of opportunity and possibility coming out of this and we're even 
created events now um, in other regions that we're really excited to undertake. And that's come from making those connections during the time where we couldn't actually go anywhere. And tell us about Birch before the pandemic. What, what was the offering like and, and, and what were you doing? Birch was a very traditional fine dining modern Australian restaurant. We had service four nights a week. We did lunches three days a week. We had an a la carte menu and a signature de- degustation menu. Following COVID, we now have reduced the service times that we have at the restaurant. I guess we made a bit of a things that piss us off list and we made a call to never, ever go back to doing those things. And lunchtime dining was certainly one of those one of those aspects. So now we concentrate on dinner service only between Thursdays and Saturdays. We've had an increased demand for private events, so people who really appreciate what it is that we do and how we do it, and we'll just book the restaurant out to make that experience happen for them and their group. We've had feature events that we've brought in, so things like regional wine nights, long lazy lunches, which is only happens once a month now on the first Sunday in each month, where we can just focus our efforts on doing share style menus and menus that feature and highlight certain wines from certain regions and produce uh, to as well as all the other things that we created in lockdown. So the takeaways and the products and the store and, and everything else. So it's certainly increased the popularity of what it is that we did prior. And I think that's a really positive thing to note is that Diners now have a different respect for what it is that a restaurant undertakes and which is a really, really fabulous and wonderful thing for the industry. So we kind of identified that really, really quickly coming out last year and we've just constantly been trying to find ways in which we could maintain that relevance and maintain that connection and be forever fresh and forever trying to find new ways to to entertain people, but also find more ways that you can experience what we do. So it's not just now food on a plate in a restaurant. It's now from a box. It's from a store. It's from purveying it online. It's from many, many different ways. How are you feeling about you're on the precipice of about to open again and you've got all of these different business models uh, that are working? What what decisions are you making about what you're keeping and, and what are you moving forward with? Oh, it's the million dollar question, is it? How do you do it all? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, a little bit of sleep's been lost trying to figure it all out. I think for us, our primary aim has always been to be relevant. So while there's a demand for something that you're doing, we kind of feel a little bit of, of responsibility to ensure that we're exploring the best ways that we can continue doing that. And that's how the store came about last year. It was purely from the fact of of not being able to do anything that you had created and had to virtually rewrite the the program to to allow us to create so many different things. And the more that we created, the more demand there was for it. So the store came about purely for the fact of when we came out of lockdown, there was no decrease in takeaway demand. There was no cr- decrease in the products that we had created, so the Birch made range, um, but we couldn't do it all from the restaurant. We just physically didn't have the space. And especially when we could go back to fuller capacities, there was certainly no capacity to accommodate any new things at the restaurant. So we were very fortunate the store space became available and we crazily, stupidly, I'm not really sure what, <laughs> what the best way of describing it would be, but we opened Birch Store and Birch Store started with just a few ready-made meals and Birch produce that we make in the restaurant. Uh, we source other local local products as well. And now it's become this little grocery Provador homeware store that allows you to cur- curate a meal, including everything from tablecloths to, to ceramics, to glassware, to meals, to feasts, to cheese, to grazing, to you name it. And we primarily aim to source things from regional or small producers. Well, tell us a bit about the regional producers that you work with that speak of the Southern Highlands. Yeah, so sadly um, we (laughs) had a very devastating bushfire season right before COVID, which had dramatic impacts on small local producers here. We lost a couple who uh, decided to move as a consequence of fire damage. We had others that established themselves because of fire and COVID impacts. 
So it's been quite an interesting 18 months from that that point of view. We're extraordinarily lucky here in the Highlands. We've got some amazing, high-quality producers, award-winning, you name it. So it's very much for us it's been about maintaining those connections with each of those producers, knowing what they're doing, how they're doing it, when they're going to have things available and tailoring what we do to how they operate. So Mother Nature has been a bit of a not very nice lady for the past few years. So we've sort of gone away with the whole seasonal menu concept and we now adopt a grower's menu. So we pretty much allows us to be more flexible with what and who is growing or producing things right now and allows us to make those changes so we can utilise things more effectively and not have to have something that's available for an entire season. And also having those sort of more smaller rogue events, as we like to call them, uh, gives us the opportunity to use things that you may only have for one or two days. So we've got some gorgeous small, small producers who might have garlic but might only be available for three weeks. We've got other guys who um, have pigs and other livestock and you might only get one or two whole pigs each season. But having that adaptability and that ability to to change what we do quickly uh, and not be, I guess, tethered to an expectation of a traditional um, menu model allows us to better utilise those local guys. What sort of role did uh, food play in your family when you were a kid? Oh, it was all about the feast. Everything was about the feast. We were very typically, my parents were meat and three veg, sit down at dinner at the table every night type of family. Every Sunday you go to Nen's, Nen had been baking since the Tuesday prior and you would sit down and have an entire feast with six desserts and all the trimmings and everything would be picked from Pop's veggie garden. So that was very much my childhood. And as my grandparents got older, my mum sort of took that role on for that family feast provider and still does. So it's always been about the feasting. And I think as I got older, like many teenagers, I, I ended up working for a caterer who did feasts on exponential scales. So you'd be doing black tie dinner events for 300 at the local function centre through to 250 packs weddings in circus tents in paddocks in the middle of nowhere. So it was an extreme, extreme sort of spectrum of events and ways in which people enjoyed food and celebration and conversation. And I really, I really feel that that, and exposure to all those different elements growing up um, certainly gave me an appreciation, not so much for the actual food on the plate, but more that process around how a feast and why a feast is created. So for us, it sort of transports to the restaurant in that we very much try and make people feel like they're at our house for dinner and we're very conversational. We're very much character driven. Uh, we're all a bit crazy. Um, but we try and put a piece of that into it. So it's not um, it's not prim and proper and hoity-toity, which um, sometimes the Highlands can have that perception of being, but we very much try and put our own, I guess, character and personality into what we do and ultimately come service time, it's just our way of sharing that. Tell us about the beginnings of Birch. Why did you choose Moss Vale and and? What was it like building the restaurant? Um, Mosfile, Mosfile has always been really, really dear to our hearts. It was where we first landed when we came to the Southern Highlands and we ended up here by accident. We were all set to move to Christchurch in New Zealand, but unfortunately an earthquake got in the way of that plan and we ended up here by accident and we ended up staying and we had, we had a small family and we were very much in the trenches of that young parenthood, but there was always that itch that we'd missed out on a bit of an adventure. So it didn't take us long to start trying to find something to stick our teeth in. We knew ultimately we wanted to work together. We explored cafes, restaurants, pubs, um, even accommodation venues. We knew it would be, have to be a service-based something for us to both to both be able to contribute to to a business model and it was just everything that we found just didn't feel quite right. It was either the location didn't really work for us or um, we didn't really have people lined up that could 
do what we needed to be done. Um, and yeah, it was all a bit confusing there for a few years and it was a bit disheartening, but then we ended up going overseas for an eight week European jaunt. And on the day that we arrived home, we discovered that the space in the old post office building in Mossvale had become available. And then it was pretty much like the universe slapping us in our face. Everything just fell into place within a matter of days. Uh, the people, the team, the crew, the space, the the fit out, you name it, everything just was going to happen and happen very quickly. So that was in the October and then Birch opens it its doors, I think, 23 minutes before Christmas that year. Um, so it was a pretty bit of a rush, but it was really, at the beginning, it was very much just a passion for us to to create a business that we could both very much be a part of and establish and work towards building. And that first year, like everyone I'm sure you've spoken to, tells you was extraordinarily tough. Um, we had some hiccups with chefs. We had hiccups with suppliers. We had... Um, oh, everything that you could go wrong. We had a drought, which caused a few few dilemmas. Um, but by the end of that first year, I don't know, there was just a moment where everything just started to feel really comfortable. And then it started to feel really consistent and we started to get some really fantastic momentum and it was just lovely. And it was very small. Like our team has never been more than five or six people. So it's a real small little family aspect as well. So yeah, it was nice. It was it was obviously that first year was an initiation of fire, as all businesses are, and hospitality I think adds a different dimension to that. But it really was it was just cruisy from then on. We sort of yeah we sort of managed that balance between the things that you should do as a new restaurant versus the things that we were passionate about and and what we wanted to bring to that model as well. And that was always a bit tricky to do, but since COVID that's been a really lovely thing that we can just throw out the door and we can just do what, what our passion wants us to do and what, where our love is and, and where our desires are. And it's a really pleasant place to be, to be able to make that decision. Regional dining in Australia has changed so much after the, over the last decade um, with some incredible restaurants. Is, is there a sense of obligation when you're um, offering a restaurant of um, like Birch in a, in a region like yours? Um, do you have a sense of obligation to the region and um, tourists as well? I think I felt the obligation more before COVID. I think there was that real trend from farm to table to have what was grown in your backyard or in your kitchen garden to be appearing on your plate. I think that's expanded a little bit. Obviously, accessibility has been a huge driver for that over the last 18 months. But I feel that our loyalty now lies with people who are as passionate about what they do as what we are. So if we can help that business by featuring them or we can discover them and and truly utilise them in a creative way, then that's kind of where I feel our responsibility is now. And that's extended now not just to food and producers. We're doing cross-industry collaborations. We've had our textile range launch this year as well, which is a collaboration between myself and a textile designer here in the Southern Highlands. Um, so I just feel the possibility for that is going to be so much bigger than probably what anyone has given thought to it to be. And I'm really excited by what potential that has going forward. Don't get me wrong. I think the the local growers and the local makers and producers is always going to be an important part to a regional restaurant. Ultimately, that accessibility is a massive driver and the loyalty and the established relationships that you have there will always be valued. But I think there's a real promise now to really highlight some new and exciting ways in which we can each leverage each other to to make a new experience going forward. What priorities have changed for you, uh, given what you've been through in the last year and a half? Uh, probably, I'd like to say balance, but I'm really crap at trying to achieve it. Um, so, yeah, it's very conscious of our crew and their families and their place within and their priorities within the community. Um, 
So really making sure that it's a lifestyle that is manageable for them and it's not too demanding. And it's probably another reason why we now close Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Um, so that's been a big thing. And I think where our kids are a little bit older than all our crew's kids. So I think we've got a little bit of, I guess, some, um, oh yeah, been there, done that aspect to it. So we can help manage them through what we think will be helpful for them. Um, other priorities are, look, just trying to balance possibilities. Like we have got so many opportunities that we've been presented with that I don't know that if we had three years, we could get everything done. It's just, it's really trying to, to find where those alignments really work and to fuel our passion and fuel our creative drive to make those those things happen obviously there's consistency that comes with doing that as well um but even we were having a conversation yesterday actually and we had the calendar for the rest of this year and going into next year and there's not very many free times and that's coming out of a pandemic that's just we would never have thought that especially second time around that it would be as hectic as what it's looking like it's going to be and I think most excitingly that is majority of those things are collaborations with wineries in different regions with um with taking birch on the road and doing events outside of our backyard is expansions to the store so that we can do more of what the demand has been for what we've created this time around so it's really exciting and i i yeah it's really funny because someone said to me the other day i'll just be really lovely i suppose to go back to do what you were doing when it was so much simpler and i'm like well no i don't think it would be i don't think that we would be satisfied in anywhere near the level that we are right now because of what we've created and I don't think there's there's certainly not a pressure to keep everything that we've created but there's certainly certainly our own our own drive to want to make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can while we can because who knows what the future holds we know learned that lesson this year You've mentioned uh, events quite a few times, both locally and interregionally. Uh, is, there, is there any particular one that you can tell us about what you, what you are creating? Yeah, so one of the biggest events we've got coming up, which was due to happen in July, was is Birch in Orange. So it's a four-day event where we pretty much pack up the restaurant. We relocate to Orange in Central West New South Wales. Both Glenn and I are from Orange, so we really had this desire to want to take – what we created back there. And we pretty much base ourselves at Printy Wineries. We undertake several events throughout the four days with Nashdale Lane Wines, with Groundstone Cafe. We do a private event with Sophie Hansen on her property, the Mandadgery Creek Venison, uh, and some tastings. And there's a VIP program as well, which people can be a part of. So we were all set to go. We even packed up the restaurant we got to Printy, we unpacked, we set up the kitchen and then Orange was put into a snap lockdown and we had five hours to pack everything up and come back to the Highlands, which was a pretty hectic 24 hours. Um, but then as soon as we got back here, we were inundated with demand to do it again and make sure it happened again, which we were very adamant it would. So it's now being booked for February next year, between the 18th and the 28th of February, and we've extended it. So our little four-day taste of taking birch somewhere else has now become a 10-day festival. And, um, yeah, we're madly just trying to – yeah, the demand is insane, so we're just madly trying to create more events to deliver in that period so that we can meet the demand that's there. Does it feel different coming out of this lockdown compared to the previous one? It does. Um, We were talking about this this morning. I am more anxious, I think, this time around. I'm not sure why, not like it was the, the instructions are any clearer, but I don't know. There's, I think there's a lot more expectation to go back to what it was faster. And I think that's going to present quite a few issues, especially over the next few weeks as, as businesses can reopen, as travel can resume, um, this your vaccination passports and all that hoo-ha as well is a, an added dilemma to it all. But I think there's more – but the anxiety is based around our operations. It's not based around what we're doing and what we're offering. It's about how our staff are going to manage with that customer that comes in and 
demands to have a seat and not be vaccinated or that customer that comes that is still from an area that can't travel to be with us. It's more about how we protect our crew and how we make it as safe as possible as we can for them because ultimately if they feel that they've been looked after, then I think the whole management aspect is going to become a whole lot easier. And just being clear and concise with with consumers and the expectations that they have. But yeah, it's tricky. I think it's it's a lot more confusing this time, which is certainly not helping anyone. The reopening uh, is is imminent. Do you do you have a plan at the moment? Are you on top of how it's going to unfold? Yeah. So we started we started communicating to all our patrons a couple of weeks ago. So we we made a decision similar to what we did uh, earlier in this lockdown. So we we were very tired of being slaves to the press conference. So we made some calls early in August and September for how long we would be only operating for takeaway, regardless of lockdowns ending, because it was, are the Southern Highlands part of Sydney? Are they not? Are they in lockdown? Are they not? And it was very, very um yeah, tumultuous and confusing and uncertain and you're forever changing each plan each day. So we just made the call that, you know what, for September we're going to operate this way. So coming out of lockdown, we we made the call that we would open a week after the expected date, which at that time was going to be the 18th of October. So we made the call to open the following week, which has bode extraordinarily well for us. Um, and I just think that... <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be tricky. You, you mentioned the issue with vaccinations. Have you got a plan for the vaccination issue? Yes. So at the moment we op- reopened bookings, we have a verification question that every booking person has to tick to continue. So that has been brought in so that from the very first moment in which people try to get a table with us, they can they know our expectation. They know that for the period in which the public health order is active, that we can't permit people who are not fully vaccinated into the restaurant. How that's going to evolve is going to be really tricky because I'm sure there's going to come a point, and they've said at this stage it's the 1st of December, that there's going to be this balance between able bookings for November to proceed with double vaccinations, but then bookings from December to proceed without double vaccination. So that crossover period is going to be incredibly tricky. Um, and we're just watching that over the next couple of weeks as things do start to reopen as to changes regarding that public health order, clear expectations around patrons and what they're required to do. And then we'll just adapt our communication strategies to meet those things because quite often people will come to us first and ask what is it that I can do before they go searching through government websites and trying to get information that way, which I don't blame them. It's quite confusing. So if we have our expectations quite clear from the very first moment that they have any interaction with us, we find that it limits any uncertainty. It limits the people who come and try and get in and not know the rules. It limits a whole lot of management aspects, which only makes it easier for people to come in, be seated and just dine, which is at the end of the day, what we all want to do. You've uh, adapted and changed and added so many elements to what you do. What are you most proud of in this sort of weird period of time that we've been through? Prioritising creativity. My accountant probably going to kill me for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but taking the time to think about things and making sure that you're creating them in the best way that you can. And that's not that's from flavour to packaging to the experience you want people to have at the end of the day. Like we've, ta- we've handed over a lot of control. We've handed over secrets and recipes and prep lists and – a whole lot of information primarily to enable people to continue having as close a birch experience as they can at home as to what they had in the restaurant, which kind of backfired because the expectation in the restaurant is now higher. But I think that transparency and that authentic approach to it, like we were from the get-go, you can't put what we do in a box. It was never going to work. So we had to create a solution whereby we could almost 99% guarantee that they could do it themselves. So that's been 
certainly one of the things we're most proud of because it's what we get the most feedback on. It's what has fueled the, the success of the store and it's where a lot of our demand is going to. So now when you get an inquiry for an event, you've got to ask the question, is this something you want to do yourself or is this something you want us to do for you? Because it's a 50-50 split. People are now more empowered to give it a go and to do what we do because we've made it so simple for them. And I think that's really been the biggest bonus for us is making sure that people know the effort and the time that goes into things. We try and do it so that that experience is guaranteed at the end of it. You ended up in Bosfell accidentally, but you've created something quite special there and and quite special out of adversity with the pandemic. What, what is it that you love about what you do? The people, always the people. I've always been drawn to characters in hospitality, even when I was catering for that circus wedding. It's just those, the people, the their experiences, where they've been, what they've done, what they've eaten, who they've eaten it with, who they've had a cooking lesson with, where they're from, what's their story, why did they choose us? It's it's that conversational aspect. It's getting to know people. And, and we're extraordinarily fortunate. Every single dinner service is your chance to meet another handful of people that you've not met before. And that's that's a very lucky thing to have. And by knowing and understanding more and more characters the longer we do this little gig, it's, I don't know, it's this beautiful insight into into people and how people work and what people prioritise. And I've always valued that and I think that this little chapter in of the restaurant uh, is a chance, it's just a beautiful thing to, to be able to have that ability to facilitate those characters and to learn about them. You mentioned the anxiety that you're feeling about reopening this time, but what are you looking forward to when you do open again? Just not having to deal with limitating logistics. So as much as we try and put an extraordinarily positive spin on everything and we try and find the best way in which we can do it, at the moment the logistical aspect of doing that is very consuming. So not being able to, not having to do that is going to be a tremendous weight and only going to give us more time to create, which we're very much looking forward to. But yeah, mask wearing is pretty annoying and education of diners, like it was just lovely when you could just talk about food and wine and places and people, but now it's all about how people are managing the pandemic and what they've not done and what they've not seen and what they've not missed out on. So putting that back onto the positive and talking about opportunity and not limitations is is going to be a pretty magical moment too. You've made so many changes to your business for the positive. Has there been changes in you personally during this time as well? I think so. I am not a homeschooling mother. <laughs> Uh, I'm also not very good at managing or balancing home work life with everything that we've created. It's very, very consuming. Um, but I think that's more a personality thing for myself. I'm always been a, a yeah, t- take off more than you can chew and figure out a way to deal with it later. So yeah, this, it's been it's definitely been a le- learning curve. I think we've all changed different ways. I didn't realise how creative and how design-minded our chef was. I didn't realise how logistically driven my husband was. And I think that's because we've all had to change what we do a little bit. And I think that's been a tremendous blessing. I think coming to every problem and every hurdle that we've had with three different, very, very different points of view and perspectives and thought capacities about how to deal with things has only enabled us to pounce faster, which is something that we get comments on all the time. So I think that power in working with people who are different to yourself is certainly a massive, massive benefit and a massive thing I didn't know that we had prior. Do you think there'll be changes in the industry and some positives that can come out of this period of time? Oh, I hope so. I hope people use and take the opportunity to use any hurdle as an opportunity. I think that's probably where our mindset 
has allowed us to grow in the way that we have. And I think by having that diverse way of thinking about things only enables you to build a more encompassing business. So I think back to when we had all our eggs in a traditional restaurant model and the thought of that now is quite frightening. I think by being able to expand and have the store, being able to maintain takeaway even when lockdown has ended, having an online store, having the ability to do private events, in-house chef services, we've just diversified so many aspects of what we do and we've only focused on the things that we love doing and making those work for the business and not us work for what we need to do. And I think that's been really positive and I hope other people can learn in about what they can do themselves and look at what they love and how they are doing it and whether there's more ways in which they can deliver it. So that's, yeah, I don't, I just, yeah, I think there's so much possibility. I, I hate the thought of having to go back to do everything the way that it was. I think that's really frightening prospects and I think that will be really limiting on the growth of the industry and I really hope that people embrace even if they don't continue in the way that they've done it due to lockdown but if they can keep that connection with the people that have been loyal to them during this time in a new way of doing something I think that would be a really really positive way of approaching the next three months three years well Renee your positivity is really inspiring and we're absolutely honored to have you on deep in the weeds today to hear a part of your story please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon will do thanks so much anthony this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector special thanks to executive producer rob lock for making this all happen Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.